So now we'll move to our final panel, uh, focus on one of Wyoming's largest industries, the coal industry. And of course, we know there are challenges facing the coal sector, but if there's one place in the U.S. or even the world that can band together to support um, coal, it's here in Wyoming. So just to give you a, a few examples, you'll hear a lot about what we're doing at the School of Energy Resources, and we're so excited to have the head of our Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion on this panel, Trina Pfeiffer. Um, but I'll talk about, just mention a few things we're doing to support the coal industry. We're working on things like carbon capture use and storage, novel um, approaches to combustion, new uses for Wyoming coal. You'll hear a lot about that. Uh, we've worked historically quite a bit on reclamation and um, other areas that could apply to the coal sector. We have a hydrogen energy research center, just a lot of things that, that we can't get into in too much detail today, but we're really um, excited about. So um, thus, yes, we understand there, there's challenges facing the sector, but we're dedicated to working with industry, working with our partners in government, in the university and beyond to address those. And so with that, I'll invite the moderator for our last panel, Mr. Travis Zetai, um, and the panelists to, to begin this panel. And so first of all, before we get started, I just wanna thank Mr. Zetai um, for being such a great partner, a leader in the state. And his, he currently serves as the executive director of the Wyoming Mining Association, WMA. So thank you all so much for being here and look forward to hearing from you. There we go. Um, Dr. Krutka, thank you so much. Uh, it is uh, an honor to be with you uh, here this afternoon. And uh, I think my understanding is we are the final panel between, uh, between the cold beer. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do what we can here and, and finish up strong. Uh, I am Travis Detai, I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Mining Association. And uh, we are the state's trade association. Uh, for all of our, our mining companies, and that includes our coal industry, uranium, bentonite, uh, trona, our natural soda ash producers. We also represent the companies that are developing rare earths and gold uh, right now in, in Wyoming. And with that, I will introduce our, our panel and then turn it over to each of them for a little bit about themselves. And then we will roll into some questions and uh, and have a good discussion on uh, Wyoming's coal resource and what we uh, hope to see and uh, are expecting in the future. So joining us uh, at the dais today is Mr. Pat Forkin. He is the Chief Development Officer for Peabody, Trina Pfeiffer, the Interim Director of the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion of the School of Energy Resources, and Ms. Mary Throne, Esquire, the uh, Commissioner from the Wyoming Public Service Commission. And so, Pat, I will give you the microphone and let you uh, talk a little bit about yourself, and we'll go right down the line and then start questions. Thank you very much, Travis. And I, too, would like to thank the University of Wyoming, SER, the Wold Family Foundation for inviting Peabody here today. Um, my name is Pat Forkin. I've been with Peabody for about uh, 12 years, my career. I would say has uh, two cornerstones to it, finance and energy. And in the energy spectrum, I've worked in fossil fuels and I've worked in renewables, including um, solar energy development uh, in Silicon Valley before I came to uh, before I came to Peabody. So Peabody is one of the largest coal companies uh, in, in, in the world. We've been around for 139 years. Um, and what I, I guess I'd like to focus on is Peabody and the state of Wyoming. So Holly said earlier today that Wyoming is an energy state and Peabody is an energy company. And I think we've developed a really um, unique partnership with, with the state of Wyoming uh, over the years that, we, um, that we've been here. Wyoming is an incredibly important state um, in that it provides the fuel uh, for a large proportion of reliable, um, economic, effective electricity. And I think we know today that's not the case everywhere. And even in the United States, we have some challenges on that, on that front. With respect to Peabody, uh, Wyoming is a is 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 very uh, important 
we're a global company and we've got mines all over the United States and Australia, and we sell into uh, countries uh, all over the world. And, but 25% of our workforce is here in Wyoming. A majority of our global coal production is here in Wyoming. And Wyoming has been a great partner for Peabody. And I hope they look at Peabody as being a great partner for Wyoming. I've heard some of the some of the panelists talking about economic development today. I would say you could look at the partnership between Peabody and the state of Wyoming as being a perfect example in that case. For us, Wyoming is a great place to do business. I'm informed by our government relations team that we're typically the top or near the top state taxpayer um, uh, for Wyoming. And uh, so it is a great place for us um, uh, to, to do business. When Governor Gordon was here earlier and he talked about the American spirit, it, it sort of just popped in my head. First thing I thought about was Peabody. We've been around for 139 years. Uh, we've been through a lot. But then I thought about Wyoming, which has been around the state of Wyoming, which has been around for about 132 years. So um, as far as that American spirit is concerned, I think we could kind of be consider ourselves fairly close uh, siblings. So I would just like to say it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been a great discussion um, so far and really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Mary, would you like to go ahead? Um, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Throne, currently a commissioner on the Wyoming Public Service Commission, uh, where I've been for about the last three years, although I doubt that it's that job uh, that brings me here today, maybe a little bit. Uh, Thank you uh, to SAR for bringing us all together and to the Wold Foundation uh, for putting on such a, a great program. We appreciate it. Uh, I have, and I, I, I sort of gasp when I say this out loud, but I have uh, about 30 years of experience in the energy and environmental world, um, years at DEQ. Hello, friends from DEQ. Uh, years in private practice, and then uh, 10 years in the legislature uh, where I worked quite a bit on uh, carbon capture legislation, Wyoming's original carbon capture uh, legislation. Uh, the Public Service Commission, though, is um, a great place to be now. It's an exciting place to be. It's not your grandmother's or your grandfather's uh, Public Service Commission. Uh, we are at the cutting edge of dealing with uh, the pressures uh, put on our coal industry uh, because of uh, the, the national goal and the goal in a number of sectors uh, to decarbonize. And so our mantra remains the same. Our mantra is safe affordable and ad, uh, reliable electricity at just and reasonable rates. And that is still our goal. But in the face of increasing electricity demand, uh, climate pressures, uh, you know, such as the heat dome that we just um, saw in the, the Northwest and in California, um, as well as a changing electric grid, uh, it's just, it's just a very dynamic, changing place to be. Uh, and I look forward to more discussion and everyone's questions. And uh, Trina, it's your turn. If you could talk a little bit about yourself and uh, give a little overview of the center, please. Um, okay, my name is Trina Pfeiffer and um, I am the interim director for the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion for the School of Energy Resources. I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk about our program today. Our program is a little bit unique uh, in that we um, are focused on non-thermal uses of coal. So instead of burning it to make electricity, we are using it to uh, develop new products, coal to products that uh, we um, people can use such as 
um, asphalt. And well, I'm gonna get into this a little bit later, but we have a lot of different um, high volume type products that we're working on. And um, so that's what the center, that's mainly the focus of the center at this point. My background, I've been with, I, okay, I was a consultant for SER for many years, about um, four and a half. And uh, I joined actually um, officially in April of this year. And prior to that, uh, I've been in the oil and gas industry for many years, working on a lot of issues that they have there. And uh, carbon capture was one of the things that I did work on as well. So um, that kind of dovetails into this center. So I'm looking forward to uh, telling you all about the program and uh, getting some comments and questions. So thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna start the first question uh, for Pat. And uh, as the uh, chief development officer for the world's largest private sector coal producer, would you um, talk a little bit about your approach to corporate development and where you see us going as far as a coal industry, uh, given uh, the situation with uh, the global climate change and the focus on such tremendous need for electricity going forward, especially if we're looking at uh, electrifying our, our automobile fleet and, and what we're going to need to do and the, and the role that coal can play in that. Thanks, Travis. Um, so my role is in, in corporate development. You know, I said Peabody was 139 years old. Um, and like Mary just said, this isn't your grandmother's commission. I would say that Peabody is not your grandfather's coal company. And I think I can say that because my grandfather was a, was a coal miner. Uh, with Peabody uh, for many years. Um, we believe that coal is going to be required, not just in the United States, uh, but globally um, for some time to come, a long time to come, um, because it is, it is unique in its properties to be able to generate electricity on a reliable and very cost-effective, sometimes the most uh, cost-effective way of generating electricity. So we are dedicated uh, to coal. We want to be think of ourselves as the producer of choice. And what does that mean? Um, it means that we want to be the best producer out there. We want to be safe. We want to be responsible. We want to be. Uh, we want to take care of our customers, our employees, all of our stakeholders. But we're doing more than that. And uh, we're doing more than, uh, than coal. Um, as an example, we've got 185,000 acres of land in the United States that we either own or we control. And we are working on a number of projects in the Midwest. We've got six uh, utility scale solar development projects that we're working on early stages, uh, but they're all looking uh, uh, very promising. Every day we handle about 38 million gallons of water. So we are looking, we were looking at things like um, using that water uh, and, and pumped hydro and pump storage um, as a source of electricity for, uh, for our mines. Um, we've got, we're in the early stages of this and, and Trina, I think we've got some intersection with SCR here. But we're looking at the geologic formations of our mines in the Midwest for CO2 sequestration, early stages of talking to um, industrial customers that would provide the, um, um, uh, the feedstock uh, for that. So um, we've got a got lot going on, Travis, with respect to what's going on today. Um, I would say that you know the coal industry has been uh, under fire, um, started probably a year after I started with, with Peabody. We've been under siege um, and we've done the math. And um, I think it's based on what's happening today, it's proof that there is a place for coal, that we are not going to be able to move away from fossil fuels overnight and still be able to provide electricity to the people who are getting it today and the people across the globe that um, you know, uh, deserve, uh, deserve to get it. So um, I hate to use the word 
vindication, but for us that have been talking about the math and the law of physics about what can and can't be done with energy density, it's an interesting time. And I hope it's a time that the coal industry as a whole um, can, um, uh, and Peabody in particular, can be that producer of choice, look forward, look at other options to provide energy and to meet the objectives of all of our stakeholders. And I'm, I'm gonna kind of just um, bounce off of that and go to Mary next. Um, a lot of the talk around coal is between the coal, uh, uh, using coal and, and keeping a, a, our environmental standards high. Uh, from your experience, Mary, would you talk a little bit about how Wyoming has uh, forever uh, balanced our energy production and environmental stewardship, and then going forward, you know, the role of, of, of technology and, and, and the use of, of developing viable carbon capture uh, to keep the resource viable for the future. Uh, thank you, Travis. And this is where the, the 30 years of experience comes in as opposed to my past three years of experience. Uh, so Wyoming has always been a leader uh, in the environment development of environmental policies. Uh, going back uh, to the 70s, uh, Governor Gordon mentioned the passage of, of the Environmental Quality Act. Uh, so at that time, um, I was not doing this. I was in high school or junior high, junior high. And uh, people like Peabody and Arco and other massive sized companies were planning to move to Campbell County, um, my home county, and um, open these huge, kind of scary open pit coal mines. And so Wyoming uh, took the lead and I believe and somebody, I'm gonna look at Kyle Wentland, he can tell me if I'm wrong, but Wyoming started developing uh, coal mining standards, uh, surface mining standards before the passage of SMACRA. In the air quality world, which I'm more familiar with, uh, Wyoming had a stricter uh, sulfur dioxide requirement than was required by the Clean Air Act. Because, and at that point there was less concern about NOx from coal plants, but a lot of concern about uh, sulfur dioxide. So Wyoming um, had a stricter standard in place because uh, companies like Pacific Power and, uh, well, we're coming in to build uh, huge power plants in Wyoming. So Wyoming got ahead of the game. Uh, Wyoming also had like the strictest minor source permitting of any state in the country, uh, which allowed us to be early regulators of, of oil and gas emissions. I know this is the coal, <laughs> the coal panel, but I think uh, that's relevant too. Also in the 70s with the leadership of uh, Senator Mike Enzi, who was in the state legislature at the time, Wyoming developed the Industrial Siding Act uh, to deal with the social and economic impacts of, of this massive development. So we have always been uh, forward, forward thinking. And I think what we have to do now um, is adjust to the changing circumstances. Uh, we've, as a state, then um, one other important point for Wyoming, Wyoming has always prided itself on primacy under the various federal environmental acts and, and, and Governor Gordon referred to that. We've, we've always worked to have a robust uh, state regulatory system with, with quality people doing quality work. And I think that that puts us in a good position, but we have to, we have to adapt uh, to changes. And so that's why we've been looking at carbon capture, uh, which we started doing 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and I think there's um, a role for, for coal going forward to kind of backtrack a little bit and respond to what Pat said. Uh, we do have to focus on reliability. And I, I don't know if anybody noticed in my opening remarks, but I, it's kind of a bulky word, but I like to talk about decarbonizing the grid. I don't like to use the phrase clean energy standards um, because nothing is clean 
<laughs> everything has impacts. On my way over today, I uh, don't, there are no highway patrolmen in the room, correct? But I was coming, <laughs> but I was coming over from Cheyenne and I saw this convoy of huge trucks with wind turbine blades and they were about to come on to, to I-80. And I was like, I do not want to get in the middle of them. And so I won't tell you how fast I had to go to, but believe me, I made sure I got ahead of <laughs> the transporting of the, of the wind turbines. Uh, but again, I think, and, and, I'm, and I'm beginning to see among the, the commissioners uh, from the Western region, um, I guess just a slight shift in the conversation. It used to be about 100% renewable and everybody is now sort of accepting the fact that uh, that's not realistic. Uh, and even some of my uh, friends from the, the Northwest Public Service Commissions who, who do have pretty, pretty forceful, uh, and they do call them clean energy standards uh, that affect what can happen in Wyoming, they recognize that we have to, to, to pull all the levers at once to be able to meet increasing demand. And I think coal can play a role in that. The, the challenge is that coal is quote unquote dirty. I don't believe that, but that's, you know, that is the mentality. And so I think we, we, have, to, we have to change the conversation and then there will be a role for coal in that reliability piece going forward. Um, going off of that, and uh, if we are to do the things that we need to do to address the issue of carbon dioxide, uh, I think there's a general agreement that carbon capture, viable carbon capture technology is necessary. And that comes from, you know, not only here in the state, uh, but around the country and, and the globe. So, uh, Trina, would you talk a little bit about uh, your work and the, and the center's work? and what we're doing here in Wyoming on the ground to frankly try to crack that nut of viable carbon capture so that we can continue to use our coal resource. Um, okay, uh, well, uh, we have a, a project that um, we have out in um, uh, one of the pilot plants that we have built. Uh, it's a, uh, a carbon capture, uh, it's an amine plant uh, and uh, it's an MEA plant. And what they're doing is they have a, a catalyst that's being developed and it's supposed to reduce the energy that's needed in order to do that amine, um, uh, you know, the absorber stripper uh, setup. So that's one thing that we are working on for, for that. Um, and uh, uh, we have other, other things that we're working on, but I, I'm not sure I can really talk about Well, I'll tell you what, we can, we can just go, we'll spin right into this. What, 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 one of the things that we look at and that, that folks have been looking at for quite a while now, um, you know, uh, at our peak when we were mining 400 million tons of coal uh, back a decade ago, uh, we're probably not gonna be there again. But uh, every little bit helps. And part of that discussion is using our coal resource uh, for other products. And so Trina, I, I know that you're in, uh, uh, working on a lot of that stuff. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that stuff and some of the opportunities uh, uh, that, we can, that we're pursuing. Um, so the, the, the resource is vast and, and to leave it in the ground is scandalous. We should use it. How, how, are, how are we looking at, at trying to, to look for other, other ways to use our coal resource other than generation? Okay, um, so the, the big uh, project that we have in the Center for Carbon Capture and Conversion is, is Carbon, Carbon Engineering Initiative. And what that does, uh, uh, back in 2016, uh, they, uh, there were several people, Richard Horner being one of them, came up with an idea to uh, take coal and instead of using it in the traditional way, come up with different ways to use coal so we could still keep uh, the coal mines open, but we wouldn't be able, we wouldn't necessarily use it for thermal uses. So um, 
<clears throat> we came up with uh, several ideas. And one of the ideas that came up with is a coal refinery. And what that involves is basically we have a uh, two, two different processes that are the heart of the refinery. One is a solvent extraction piece and the other part is a uh, pyrolysis piece. So uh, those two uh, technologies combined together, uh, we, are, uh, we actually have two pilot plants. One is a solvent extraction pilot plant that's up and running now. Same with the pyrolysis unit, we have a pilot plant for that. And we have several um, different, uh, 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 different colleges uh, in, uh, within UW that are part of our, our whole um, carbon engineering initiative. Uh, we have people from the College of Agriculture. We have uh, <clears throat> the people from material science. We have chemical engineering, we have chemistry. And uh, we have about nine uh, principal investigators that are working on different products in order to uh, develop a, a uh, product slate. And <clears throat> so some of the products that we are working on, uh, one of them I mentioned before is asphalt. So it's coal derived asphalt instead of petroleum based asphalt. That's one thing we have. Another one we have is using coal char for a soil amendment. Uh, what we have found over the last few years uh, of putting, we, we have a two-year study coming up on three years in uh, the fields in Lingle and in uh, uh, Powell, Powell and Sarek, uh, those two places that we have. Um, and uh, what is happening with the, the, the fields there is the, the coal char is actually retaining moisture for uh, these fields. So that's actually something that is really positive for Wy the state of Wyoming. Um, <clears throat> we also have a building materials that we're working on. One thing we have is a char brick house. I don't know, a lot of people know about the brick house already. Uh, if you uh, get a chance while you're here to go by, it's 19th and Harney, right by the High Bay building. Uh, it would be a great opportunity for you to see what we can actually do with coal char. Uh, um, making different building materials. One of them, like we say, is the brick. We also have um, some uh, grout and uh, we're also working on some other composites that are coal-based for building materials. So uh, our focus for the coal refinery at this point in time is high volume, not high um, uh, value. Although the high value is very, very important, but the high volume is what's gonna drive uh, the refinery at this point in time. So uh, that's essentially uh, uh, the program that we're working on. And we've, we have tremendous successes. We're starting to look at commercialization. Uh, uh, so that's basically the idea, what we're doing on, on our carbon initiative. Okay. Um, let's shift gears back a little bit, um, Pat. What work do you think the University of Wyoming should be doing to support uh, continued consumption of Wyoming coal in the energy mix? Yeah, I think uh, what we what everybody's heard here today is that the university and SE are doing some tremendous work. Uh, Trina just talked about um, soil amendment, had a chance to look at the poster um, and have a nice discussion on that. I, we personally believe that that's got some tremendous uh, potential and um, really in a, in a, in a high value um, way. I, um, the work that is taking place here is just incredible. Uh, it really is. So I can't say there are other things that SER needs to be doing. I would say it's let's keep doing what you're doing and maybe do more of it and let us know how we can help you um, you know, continue to advance here. Thank you. And uh, we're starting to get some really good questions from the audience. Uh, keep them coming. Um, I'm going to follow up uh, with something that Mary said. Uh, this is a question from the audience, Mary, not from me. You mentioned that all developments have impacts. Renewables require hundreds of times more materials than other sorts of plants. How much renewables can we tolerate and still believe we are quote unquote saving the earth as Governor Gordon said earlier today? Uh, 
You know, I think the uh, maybe the con conventional answer to that uh, roughly is we can probably keep the lights on with 80% renewables, but that's, I was just looking at EIA data before I got up here and now the numbers are all jumbled in my head because I'm a history major, but um, you know, we're not, we're not anywhere near that now. I think that maybe the answer to the question is we, as we're sitting here today, it's very hard to envision the mix of what we need uh, in that 2030 to 2050 time frame to achieve the the decarbonization decarbonization goals, um, you know the panel right before this was about the rare earth minerals. Uh, I've been in a number of um, commission meetings where you know that is cited as a a difficulty going forward. The battery technology is getting better, but it's not there yet. I'm really not answering this question, Travis, but uh, I think I think the you know the the goal realistic goal might be 80% renewables and 20% of everything else. Uh, but again, I think it's going to take everything and a and just sort of a rational approach if we really want to hit those. Uh, decarbonization goals. Okay. Before I'm a grandmother or after I'm a grandmother. Trina, uh, well, let's go back to you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, so it's kind of a two-parter we got from the audience. Um, where do we stand on coal liquefaction? That's the first question. And then a follow-up on, on the char. Uh, does, does this char, <coughs> excuse me, does this char you speak of being applied to fields release moisture or has it absorbed the moisture readily for plant use? Say that again. I'm gonna let you read it. <laughs> but where do we stand on coal liquefaction first? Okay, um, so our, our center, uh, we're not really doing any coal liquefaction. We're actually doing solvent extraction. And so we take a solvent and we extract the coal liquids out of that, which is a little bit different than um, coal liquefaction, I believe. So, um, <clears throat> and then we take the, the there's, there's two products out of that. One of, one of them is the liquids off uh, the coal and that is called um, extract. And what we do with the extract is that's what we're passing on to um, the asphalt group then they work on uh, developing our asphalt products. And then also uh, there's another uh, product, which is the residue, and that is concentrated. Um, we're actually looking into whether that has concentrated rare earths. So that's something that we're looking at right now, which is, we think there is, uh, we're pretty sure there are, but uh, we're looking at that as well. Um, so let's see, what's this other question? Um, is the char release it's beautiful the penmanship. It's just hard to read. Release the moisture it has absorbed readily for plant use. Um, so I, 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 from what I understand, the, the char actually retains the moisture in the soil. So it keeps, it keeps, you don't, it, it, I mean, Wyoming is very arid. So as far as having to water it, you wouldn't have to water it as often is, is my uh, thought on that. So I think that's that's more what the soil amendment uh, or the the coal, coal char would be doing. So I think that that probably answered that. I believe. Hopefully. It makes sense to me. Uh, Patrick from the audience, doesn't it make sense to continue to use coal for generating electricity, especially using advanced ultra super critical plants? They are highly clean and efficient. And then I'm going to ask Mary to follow up on that. Uh, to talk about uh, how would we be able to build a new coal-fired power plant in the United States or in Wyoming? So, Patrick, I'll let I'll let you take a crack at that first. I'm curious. Do you think this is going to be a really short answer? The answer is yes. It makes total sense to continue to use the best technology available to combust coal to produce reliable, um, cost-effective electricity. Um, so, it is uh, 
It's that simple. It makes absolute sense. Go ahead, Mary. Tell us how we're going to get a new power plant. Uh, could you repeat the question? Doesn't it make sense to continue to use coal for generating electricity, especially using advanced ultra supercritical plants? They are highly clean and efficient. Um, I guess the, the question doesn't talk about the, the carbon issue. I mean, they Wouldn't are- Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I think I'll go to the new power plant question. I, I think, you know, you cannot build a new coal-fired power plant today. I mean, the, the market is, is not there. You can't find investors. I think uh, making carbon capture economically viable and getting, I mean, who'd have, I'm, I'm looking at my friend from the INL, but who, who would have thunk that we would all be loving advanced nuclear now, those of us who were uh, in college when Three Mile Island happened. So I think we need a, a similar change of heart, uh, you know, among the investment community, um, the communities in general, uh, to get comfortable with the idea of different uses of coal that would, and, and carbon capture. You, you, you cannot build a carbon emitting thing right now. Let's keep on that topic though, Mary. Um, you've been right in the middle of, of a lot of the legislative uh, efforts uh, to keep our coal plants in Wyoming from retiring early. Can you talk a little bit about that and how, uh, how the Public Service Commission is taking a look at some of these uh, energy technologies and I don't want to say the politics, Sandra, but some of the legislation uh, surrounding it and, and some of the economics involved. Um, sure. And I'm, I'm not really in the middle of it. I mean, that as the, the Public Service Commission uh, implements the laws uh, that are passed. And so, uh, so Wyoming passed, uh, the legislature passed Senate File 159, which requires uh, the owner of a retiring coal unit to to look for a buyer uh, of the unit if they want to recover the costs of any replacement generation. They have to make a good faith effort. So we spent a great deal of time as a commission developing rules for that process. Uh, to date, no one has uh, applied under that. I think the, the first one could possibly be uh, Rocky Mountain Power uh, for, for the Naughton plant. Uh, and then the law changed again, but let's not talk about that. Uh, so 2023, 24, we, we had expected an application already with the retirement of Jim Bridger one or Jim Bridger two, uh, but now Rocky Mountain Power plans to convert that to natural gas. Uh, then the other um, piece of legislation that we're in the middle of now, and we do have pending cases, and I can't talk about those, uh, is House Bill 200, which uh, requires uh, utilities to uh, develop a certain amount of their power from dispatchable low carbon electricity. And low carbon electricity is defined as coal uh, with, with carbon capture. So those applications are pending. Uh, the preliminary and only two utilities are subject to that law in Wyoming, uh, Black Hills Energy and Rocky Mountain Power. Uh, they filed their uh, initial plans in March of, uh, or at the end of March of 2022. And then their final plans are due um, in March of 2023 with the goal being to have met the standard by 2030. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is another question from the audience and I'm gonna give this one to, uh, uh, to Pat. Um, when looking at non-fuel uses of coal, I had mentioned earlier in my comments that every little bit helps. Um, what is Peabody and in general, the, the coal industry's attitude uh, to these applications? Is it just peanuts or is there a real interest or a growing interest in non-fuel uses for Powder River Basin coal? 
it's already been talked about a little bit here, but I think there is um, some pretty substantial potential. Again, I'll go back to the examples of the um, using coal char for uh, for soil uh, amendment. Uh, what have we done? We've made um, small investments on alternative uses of coal and using um, coal waste um, to uh, develop other uh, energy um, uh, products. So. We think it's part of a, a comprehensive solution. And, um, you know, that's why we're so excited about the work that's being done here by, uh, by SER. So uh, we do think it's important, Travis. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right back over to uh, Trina. Uh, this is another question from the audience. We often talk about geologic carbon sequestration, but what is the, vi the viability of biological carbon sequestration and carbon recycling? I don't understand the question. Who's <laughs> asking this? We've got some smart people asking tough questions. We often talk about geological car geologic carbon sequestration, but what is the viability of biological carbon sequestration and carbon recycling? Okay. Um, all right. We have a. I don't know if this really answers the question, but I'm going to go with it. Okay. So. Um, we have one of our uh, projects where we're taking um, uh, algae from uh, Wyoming. Uh, it was it was harvested in Wyoming and it's being used uh, in uh, a plant that we've got a pilot plant that we're running. And these algae feed on CO two. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is understand whether uh, the off gas coming from our solvent extraction unit or our, pyro our pyrolysis unit can be fed directly into these bioreactors so um, the algae can uh, basically consume the CO2. And one of the goals of our coal refinery is to have net zero uh, or net negative carbon. So that's, the re that's one of the ways we're trying to um, uh, work on that. So I think, I think that answered the question. It's not my question. Well, <laughs> thinking that's, that's, I think that hope, was the hoping that's, that was a college try. What you're asking. <laughs> uh, Pat, I'm going to bounce back to you. Um, is Peabody working to export coal to Europe in anticipation of the cold winter without Russian gas? Yeah. So it's, um, it's a pretty dynamic world uh, that we live in right now. And I think what we're seeing is a um, combination of tail events that even the best scenario planner could not have uh, project, uh, you know, predicted or, or, or put onto a, a drawing board. And this is just my view, but when you talk about Europe, I think what we're seeing now is the result of um, really bad energy policy over many years that's coming home to roost. And so what is it impacting? It, it's impacting national security. It's impacting um, great industrial nations like Germany, their ability to manufacture and keep jobs. And, um, um, and affordability, you know, power prices in in uh, the the UK and Germany are probably six to seven times what they were just a year ago, and they're going higher. It's going to be a cold winter, and they're going into the winter with a decent amount of storage, um, but it's it is really going to be a challenge. And then, what happens next year if you get through this winter? What happens next year? Does Russia change? I don't know if anybody believes Russia is going to change course in a short period of time. And the rest, you know, Europe is going to say, OK, we're good. Let's start taking your gas again. I don't think so. So to answer the question, we uh, we are seeing, um, yes, heavy request for imports of coal into um, all parts of, of Europe and from places we haven't seen before. 
We are seeing some desperation in that, you know, over the years when it was a buyer's market for coal and you had cheap natural gas, that power plants were very um, specific in the specifications that they wanted from their coal, certain amount of heat, certain amount of uh, ash and sulfur and, and what have you. And now we're seeing requests for, we'll take anything that you have. We need the heat. So we will burn anything. And on that point, we're seeing something in the coal industry that we've never seen before. Typically, um, uh, you, you see metallurgical coal that's used for steel fabrication being a higher value product, okay? Right now, thermal coal is twice uh, the price of metallurgical coal, um, and it's never happened before. So you see manufacturers of or producers of metallurgical coal selling coal into the thermal market because the generators are are, are desperate for that. So um, there is increased demand. We are seeing new interest in PRB coal from all over the world. And uh, the biggest challenge we have currently with that is logistics. So we've got energy policy in the United States that doesn't like us to have to be able to use ports on the West Coast, uh, on the West Coast to export uh, coal. I think everybody is uh, familiar with the challenges that we've had with rail. I think those challenges were on a path for those to be resolved. And um, so we're working with customers all over the world to qualify PRB coal into international markets that, that we haven't been able to sell coal into in the past. So it's not just Europe, uh, it's, it's Asia as well. And I, I want to follow up just kind of on what you said with the, the new interest in, in PRB coal. Um, you know, recently, uh, you can't get it off the West Coast uh, out of the Northwest. Are there other avenues to get PRB coal out of the country, uh, recognizing logistics, or does it just not pencil out at this time? Or uh, how, how can we get Powder River, River Basin coal out of the United States? Um, it's again, it's all infrastructure. We can get it. For example, we could we could put PRB coal um, on the water through Houston and using one of the Class One railroads to get to get down there. It's um, you know everybody has been surprised, including the railroads. You know, for 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 decades, they had been allocating capital to investment to handle coal, and even they throttle back. It's still very important uh, to the BN and to the to the UP. It's at least twenty percent of their profits, um, but they they had allocated less capital, and um, so they're having to gear up a little bit. But they want to know that this demand is real. And then it's sustainable for a, a reasonable period of time where they can recapture any reinvestment that they make into their fleets uh, to carry it to ports, to get it on the water and export it to other countries. Thank you. Um, Mary, I'm gonna have you put your former uh, state legislature cap on. Question from the audience. What is the current coal severance tax rate? 6.5%. Should the state consider changing the rate? And, and I would note that we, we just did change the rate. We, we did just change the rate. Uh, I'm not a legislator anymore, <laughs> but I would say no. I'll just make a short answer, no. Wouldn't you agree? I think that's kind of a political question. We'll stay away from the political. I'm not questions. a politician anymore. So, um, that, Travis. Trina, are there opportunities uh, to make capture rates greater than 90%? I'm, I'm assuming carbon capture rates uh, by integrating biomass to get to zero emissions or negative emissions from coal plants? That's a great question. And, um, I, we're working on that. I don't have an answer right now. We are working on that. Okay. We are definitely working on that. But that, that's a very good question. But I don't have any data to 
give you at the moment. How would you how would you go about doing that? What would be the just the mechanics of doing that? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. You're, we're working on it. I'm working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Holly's going to help. Okay, sorry. I can't help myself. I'm going to save Trina. Phone a, phone a friend. Phone a friend. So um, one of the things that we haven't Talk, we haven't spent much time working on since Trina took over, but the center has worked on is new combustion technologies like flameless pressurized oxy combustion that can really easily co-fire biomass and coal. So you can have a power plant that's mostly coal fired, has a little bit of biomass, has very, very high capture rates, um, well above 90%. So that means you're removing almost all the emissions and you can actually get to a majority a coal fire power plant that has net negative emissions. And you can also do that for the existing fleet. So we've known a long time that without major modifications, small amounts of biomass can be co-fired with coal. Um, and then commercial CC carbon capture, commercial carbon capture now um, has passed the 90% mark. So there is a pathway to use existing coal fire power plants to get to net zero or even maybe carbon negative operation. And I would challenge anyone before they close one of those plants prematurely to look at the costs of uh, removing emissions from the atmosphere. And I, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do in this space, but I think it's something we should be working on that this is probably one of the lowest costs for carbon removal. And we're not pursuing it, not because of technology, but because, um, because of politics on, or I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but you know, it's, it's one of the lowest cost options for carbon removal. And we really should be pursuing it. If you just look at this from like a fair, very logical engineering type standpoint. So I won't, I won't go on anymore because I'm not on this panel, but I really wanted to say that. And so thanks. <laughs> Anybody else from the audience want to get up and participate in the panel? I, but could I, could I piggyback on on what Holly said, Please um, do. you know, in terms of the politics of it all, which have kind of, again, made made coal a villain. The villain is not coal. The villain, using air quotes, you know, is greenhouse gases. And if we can all agree that we need to pursue decarbonization goals, and I think there is consensus on that point now, can we just have a practical discussion about how we do that? and keep the lights on. That's just my basic view, but coal, coal has been cast as, as a villain. And when I have a chance to speak on panels like this outside of Wyoming, um, I, I tell them that, you know, in Wyoming coal is not the villain. And so can we, can we change the narrative of the conversation? Thanks, Mary. I, I think that's an excellent answer. Um, Pat, uh, question for Patrick. Uh, this is kind of a softball question. Uh, we've had a few softballs up here, but this one might be a real softball. And, and Mary, and Mary you, can, you can jump in on this one as well. Natural gas is a high quality, quality energy source, not much different than electricity itself. It is also a chemical feedstock. Doesn't it make sense to burn coal to make electricity rather than use natural gas. I'm going for the short answer again. No, seriously, it's it's a mix of fuels is, is the right answer uh, for our country and for the world. And Mary, I think we do have alignment that we do have CO2 emissions that, um, um, we can meet those objectives, but it's gonna take technology and it's gonna take time. The technology is a lot of what we talked about here today, but we can get there. In the meantime, it's all of the above. That is gonna produce the, the, the best result. Right now, that answer at, at, uh, with, with $8 natural gas, yeah, if you can dispatch coal, you're dispatching coal. Cause you can probably do that at $20 a megawatt, and you're dispatching 
natural gas at $90 a megawatt. So you want to do, if you have that capacity and you want to do the right thing for your rate payers, you're going to dispatch coal. Uh, we've got about five minutes and I've got a, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, Trina. Could you please elaborate more about construction materials from coal? Uh, as, uh, and uh, is this an industry that can possibly use large volumes of coal? Okay, so um, yeah, the building materials project is one of our, um, uh, one of our best projects we have. Uh, uh, very diverse. We have the, uh, the bricks, the coal char bricks, which the bricks are, are lighter weight. They are, uh, one of the questions we get is, you know, won't they burn? No, they don't burn because it's made out of coal char. So you don't have anything to really burn there. And so what's nice about that is the bricks are, are lighter, class A, fire rating. <clears throat> um, they actually have less VOC emissions than a clay brick does. The char brick house was built um, mainly because eventually all of the, the in all of the, um, construction pieces will be made out of out of the, the coal char eventually. So um, uh, right now the bricks are what's there and we have it being monitored for uh, a year. And uh, we have some really good data so far on that. Uh, one of the other things that the, the char brick house uh, does is absorbs the heat in the summer better. So inside it keeps the, the inside cooler. And in the wintertime, uh, we're expecting it to be the reverse where it keeps the heat in and keeps the cold out. So uh, uh, so the building materials are uh, a, a significant part of what our project, our, our whole project is. And yes, uh, the, the, the building materials would have large volumes of coal, large volumes of, of coal that we would use to make the coal char. So yes, so that, that's one of our, our key Key one. The, the key products that we have for the coal refinery are, are the, the char, which is for the building materials, which I just spoke about, and the soil amendment, and then also the extract for the asphalt. Those are the three really large volume uh, um, products that we have. So, all right. Thank you. Uh, this will be the last question from the audience, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak it just a little bit because I think it's a good question and one to end on. Uh, in Scotland, an open pit coal mine was transformed into a combination park and land art tourist attraction. What are the prospects for such a project in Wyoming? And I think what I would uh, ask, and uh, you know, Pat, I'm going to give you this. Uh, a panel like this would be remiss without talking about uh, the work that our companies do on reclamation. And, and restoring the land once they've disturbed it. So if you could kind of talk to that a little bit, Pat, and then Mary, uh, from your experience, maybe weigh in on that a little bit. And I think that would be a good, a good way to end the panel. Yes, thank, thank you for that question. And uh, I'll go back to something Mary said earlier. It was 1976, I believe, that SMACRA came into effect, which basically said, when you mine, you need to turn that land back into its original condition or something better. So that is what the industry is doing. That's what we're doing at our three mines here in Wyoming. And uh, many people in this room may have seen it, but go look at some of that land that's been reclaimed. It is beautiful. I would argue that you can build parks on it, uh, big open spaces. Uh, you can use it for many different things. It's beautiful. What you do with some of the water features, I would argue, maybe even makes it even more beautiful um, uh, than it was. So uh, that is definitely um, um, possible in Scotland. You know, they 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 really throttle back on um, coal mining some some time ago, and I, I would argue in Wyoming, um, we th there are some of the best standards to be great stewards of the land. And uh, the use for that land is, uh, once it's been reclaimed, uh, is immense. 
uh, looking at my, my friends from Campbell County. Campbell County's got all sorts of ideas for what they would like to do uh, with uh, the coal mines. Um, but if you uh, look around Glenrock, a lot of those wind turbines are on a reclaimed uh, coal mine. Uh, Campbell County is looking into, uh, and even though, and I think there are exceptions to permit requirements that can be developed, uh, but using that industrial infrastructure that's there in Campbell County, uh, another way. Though there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, I don't know if I can, I just drove up and down Highway 59 on Saturday and I just, I don't know, a water feature doesn't seem like a likely choice, but I think there, there are a lot of, a lot of possibilities and, uh, uh, and certainly we have the, the standards in place to, to help it happen. Can I just mention? Maybe? Absolutely. Okay, so um, just to pitch our soil amendment again, um, uh, we also are looking at reclamation on some of the coal mine lands for just looking at that to see if the coal char would help with reclamation. So I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, thank you. Well, to end this, I would just uh, note, uh, thank you to our panelists uh, for an excellent discussion. I don't think anybody disagrees that the coal industry in Wyoming has challenges, um, but those challenges and those problems are gonna be solved by the people in this room, especially the young people in this room. Uh, technology, collaboration and partnerships are the key. And uh, events like this, Dr. Krutka and, and your team uh, are, are where those, uh, those decisions get made. And they're certainly better uh, than a decision out of Washington, D.C. or out of Cheyenne, which nine times out of 10 will screw things up. So the solution to the, the problem is in this room. Uh, I would like to thank again, my panel. Thank you all of you for being here. Uh, thank you to the Wold Foundation and the School of Energy Resources. And uh, if there are any particular takeaways, please share them and conclude the session. So I was reading my notes to myself. So with that, uh, is it time to go out and have a beer? Not quite, oh. not quite. Thank, almost, but uh, thank you. This was an excellent way to end the technical part of it. So thank you very much. I'm about to introduce Mr. Jack Wald, who's gonna give us our closing remarks. Before I do, I want to thank the students who ran your questions back forth, back forth. Thank you, Emily, Victoria, Isaac, Ellen, and Sophie. Now you know who my students are. I'd like to thank the students who returned to Laramie for, they're, they're actually here for a wedding, although I'd like to think they're visiting me, they're here for a wedding. But they work from the East Coast to the West Coast in nanotech, in oil, gas, and in geothermal. And I know they're appreciative of a theme that permeated all through the day. How can we develop Wyoming economically so that we can keep our best and brightest? Because we do have a brain drain and we do send them away and we wanna keep them here. So though I was heartened to hear that that's a priority we have as, as are those visitors. To the students with posters, please, after Mr. Jack Wold makes his remarks, you can grab your quick refreshment, but get back to your posters so the judges can finish evaluating your posters. And then at 530, we will announce the results. So with that, I'd like to thank again this panel, all our other moderators and our panelists today, and introduce Mr. Jack Wold, president at Wold Oil Properties, and board member of the Wold Foundation to provide our closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, John. I'm reminded of, of the question, why do bank robbers rob banks? Because it's where the money is. Well, along the same line, why do energy companies, professor, or professionals in energy, students, who want to pursue careers in energy, why do they come to Wyoming? It's where the energy is. It's simple. It takes a big effort to make it be successful. Our foundation is very honored to have co-sponsored this with the School of Energy <clears throat> Resources. Um, and special thanks to Holly, John, um, and Christine Reed 
uh, with the with SER. We also want to acknowledge Glenda Thomas, who is the executive director of the World Foundation. Glenda, thank you for your help and to all of you. So thanks. I know that our father would be smiling from above looking down on us because he really loved the intellectual dialogue when it came to talking about energy, energy development and Wyoming resources and how you're able to develop those resources. He was a visionary and he really loved this industry. He worked up until the day he died and he died when he was just under 101 years old. So I would say that I would fully agree with Ken Lay on his enthusiasm. Uh, it's contagious for nuclear energy. I think there's a future there. I was talking earlier with Glenn Ketchpool. Glenn was a, a veteran of the uh, uranium industry exploration uh, back in the 70s, the 80s. We were, we were reminiscing about how active that industry was at that time and what a great valley we've been in over the last several decades. But I think it's evident by the, the discussion of the, of the nuclear panel that it's a bright future uh, and we can all be excited about it and should be uh, strong endorsers of that industry. I also wanna thank those from academia who participated today, uh, uh, Tara Rigetti, Dr. Rosoli, um, uh, Fred McLaughlin and Trina, because it's really, really refreshing to hear members from academia who have a practical understanding of fossil fuel industry and the extractive industry. It's uncommon. I spent 16 years as a director of, of, of a liberal arts college. And I have to tell you, I feel that those professors had their head in the sand when it came to fossil fuels and how we are ultimately gonna energize the United States. It's, all about climate change and the best way to handle that is through technology and, and scientific approach uh, to the problems that we all face. Bill Berry gave, a, gave some very interesting comments on, on how energy can improve everybody's lives and our lifestyle. Uh, he also highlighted the need for cooperation, cooperation between industry, academia, government, and he was one who really did focus on capital needs and the capital requirement for these projects is great. And we need to be able to utilize that. And so much of our capital is currently being constrained by the ESG concept of how you invest in, in uh, energy projects. Steve Melzer, thank you for your kind comments about, uh, about our father. He enjoyed uh, the discussions he had with you about carbon and carbon capture. Appreciated your comments. Uh, and helping me to better understand the difference between CCS and CCUS. Um, great, great talk. And I look forward to being able to review your slides with, uh, uh, in more detail. Erin Campbell and her group uh, recognizing critical minerals uh, and the role that, that REs are gonna be playing in the future. Whether we think that uh, electric vehicles will be able to reach what the expected demand is going to be questionable, but nevertheless, rare earths are going to play a major part in energy development and everybody's standard of living uh, as we move forward. We wish uh, um, Randy Scott, sorry, Randy, we wish you the very best of luck in your project up in uh, the northeastern part of the state. You know, several years ago, I thought coal was dead. That's what everybody was hearing from the media. But I think that if we look at what was going on today and we could talk about other uses of coal, but also coal ultimately is gonna play a role in generation of electricity because economics matter. And we can look at other alternatives and what kind of, how are we going to affirm some of the alternative energies that are being uh, so strongly pushed today uh, uh, by so many who perhaps don't have, have the practical experience and the understanding of physics behind energy. Uh, I would also say uh, that it's gonna take uh, a tremendous effort in technology. There wasn't a panel up here today that didn't talk about new technologies and how important 
what role they're going to be playing, uh, whether technologies come from government, whether they come from industry or combination with academia, it's a combination of the three. And I think that that was evident by the participation in, in, in this, uh, our seminar. All three of those play a significant role. And it takes a combination, I like to think of some older visionaries. There is a role for gray hairs um, and also for youthful enthusiasm uh, and imagination to be and make our program successful. To the students in the room, I would say, be creative, use your imagination, ask questions, challenge your professors and your mentors. And as Governor uh, Gordon said, create par new paradigms and let's go break some eggs. So safe travels. Thank you all for your participation. It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful day. Thanks to all of you.